Did you ever notice how the sequel to Blade Runner had a lot of gender in it? Let's talk about it. Am I giving girl boss energy in this outfit? I feel like this is how female tech billionaires are going to dress as they do yoga on the intern's backs or something. I kind of feel like I've come full circle with my politics in a way. I started out as a young feminist talking about the gender wage gap and here I am again talking about women in work, but with a lot less hand wringing about women's relative representation in the tech industry. Look, if I'm suddenly not the only woman on my dev team, they might start expecting me to do better work and I can't have that. I think there's a lot less appetite these days for the kind of PMC woman in the workplace coverage that peaked in the era after Sheryl Sandberg's now infamous lean in. That's the kind of worker that's always the focus of these discussions. White collar professional work. Anything that happens in offices. Not much focus on nurses or teachers or god forbid retail workers. And there's this whole cottage industry that emerged in that era to this day still cranking out articles telling women how to say, excuse me, I was speaking and I actually said that earlier for upper middle class women with social anxiety who had carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man tote bags. This to me represented a development in our culture's attempts to answer the question, what will it take to give us gender equality in the workplace? Whereas the answers in past decades were more legislative in nature, legally mandating equal pay for women and codifying women's legal equality into the constitution with an equal rights amendment. Wait, that never passed? Oh, well that's probably fine. Like with many social problems, we've since been encouraged to look within for solutions. Now is as good a time as any to make something clear. I talk a lot about women and women's reproduction in this video, and I think it's important to acknowledge two things, because unfortunately there are a lot of assholes out there I don't want to be mistaken for. So number one, childbearing is not fundamental to every woman's experience of womanhood. It's not universal. Some women are infertile or have had surgical or medical interventions in their fertility. Some women are transgender. Some women don't want children and would probably not feel like the possibility they can get pregnant is central to their lives. Number two, not everyone who can get pregnant is a woman. There are trans men and non-binary people who bear children. I have no idea how those people relate to that experience, but I'm sure it's varied and many aspects of those experiences won't conform with what I'm saying, and many aspects probably will. With that in mind, I'm choosing to talk about this in terms of women and women's reproduction. Because where I'm talking about reproduction in this video, I'm talking about women as a social category and class, about reproduction on the social and political level, and about the social narratives around these things, which are all tied up in our social ideas of womanhood and women's roles. In the past few years, further research into the gender wage gap has revealed something that my fellow Redditors have deemed a devastating blow to feminist dogma. The majority of the gap is accounted for not by outright discrimination, but by women's choices, including time away from work, especially to have children, a tendency to work in generally less well-paying jobs, especially those which offer more flexibility, and working fewer hours. You might have noticed that all of these have to do with motherhood, and that was very astute of you. Well done. While some professional industries are now offering paid family leave, which has been shown to significantly affect how many women leave the workplace after giving birth, most non-government workers don't have access to paid family leave. According to one survey, 43% of working women leave the workplace when they have children, and while they tend to slowly come back as their children get older, with 70% ultimately rejoining the workforce, only 40% of those who return resume working full time. And this is before the pandemic, where while labor participation dropped precipitously last year for men and women, parents and non-parents alike, it's mothers who have been the slowest to rejoin to pre-pandemic levels. The why for all of this isn't particularly difficult to disentangle. For a number of reasons ranging from social expectation to economic practicality to pure personal preference, in most situations someone needs to stay home at least when children are very young, and more often than not that someone is the mother. Despite this, according to Pew, dual income households have made up the majority of households with children under 18 since the 80s, and while I'm sure a lot of this is neo-Marxist gender ideology poisoning our women into emulating masculinity or whatever, a lot of it is necessity. Since 1979, while productivity has continued to rise, wages have not kept pace, and adjusted for inflation, wages peaked 45 years ago, with most recent gains going to the highest earners. With that, there's just less time for the domestic work that in past decades would have been handled by a stay-at-home mother. 
While statistically most working women are still dealing with a second shift and that they are expected to carry on a larger share of the household work and childcare after their paid work, many have also chosen to hire house cleaners to supplement their own cleaning. And it's market-based solutions to the issues of gender equality like this that increasingly interest me. Similarly, for many families, especially single-parent households, but also in households where a dual income is necessary, paying for childcare at least some of the time, such as when a trusted friend, neighbor, or family member can't be relied on, is a necessary reality. And for those who don't have someone to take on the entire work of childcare and need to work to stay afloat, hiring someone is the only alternative to leaving children alone. For lower income parents, this is basically only possible thanks to the low wages of childcare workers, on average earning just $11 an hour as of 2019. Essentially, in order for women to join the workplace in the way that they have, the work they were relied upon to do in the household has increasingly become commodified and is being done by lower income women, disproportionately black or Latina. Now, it's worth recognizing here that this framing makes it sound like this is just naturally the work of women, but it's not. It was traditionally done by women because back when it was possible for middle class families to live on just one income, it was considered the job of a housewife to take over the whole of domestic labor for much the same reason house cleaners and daycare workers are hired today. Work doesn't really leave people the time to do these things. Another path many highly educated women take is to delay starting a family. And this apparently has the intended effect as, according to one study, waiting until after 30 to have kids minimizes career income losses. And this is another area in which the market has seemingly stepped up, egg freezing. For women who are worried that by the time they've accomplished what they want to accomplish before having kids, there's this somewhat overhyped and somewhat very justified fear that pregnancy will just not be possible for them any longer. And for them, the cost of egg freezing, on average 30 to 40k, is worth it. And make no mistake, this is something their bosses are very into. Facebook and Apple started offering egg freezing to employees in 2014, and over the years it spread to more tech and finance companies. Today, hundreds of companies offer this benefit with the help of fertility-oriented startups like Carrot Fertility and KindBody, which often frame these services in terms of female empowerment. Technology, much like the free market, is often looked to as a solution to problems that might otherwise be solved by better workplace or social policies. Although these are ultimately distractions from actual solutions, I can't help but feel that same glimmer of optimism at the prospect of some present human limitation being overcome by your ingenuity. Egg freezing seemed to encourage that optimism for a lot of women, which is why when it fails some of them it can be so difficult to see. While these technologies can still be valuable and the goal of giving people more time to make decisions about parenthood is a good thing, I can't help but notice what's missing from the conversation. Why do we, not just women, but everyone, have to work so much in the first place when productivity is so high? Why should family and life outside of work need to be sacrificed just to make a living? Why isn't our economy structured to facilitate human life and happiness rather than the other way around? The effects of our work culture, the long work hours, and the expectation to always be available go beyond just affecting the work-life balance of women. A study from Cigna links the worsening of America's loneliness epidemic to these factors, but predictably suggests mental health support as a solution rather than cutting working hours. In this increasingly alienated society, people rely more and more on social media and forming parasocial relationships for some semblance of human connection. The share of Americans who have never married is at a record high, and in the last 20 years, sexual activity has decreased among adults in the US, particularly for younger men. The tremendous growth of OnlyFans speaks to this. Japan, which is even worse off in terms of both work culture and loneliness, as YouTuber Solari points out in his video on the topic, presents a further development in the form of Gatebox, a virtual assistant that acts as a girlfriend for the user. The thing I really want to hit home with this section in preparation for talking about this film is that capitalism functions to do what is profitable, and now that it's been determined that it needs a labor force more than it needs the social and domestic reproduction of labor, those roles traditionally filled by women will be commodified and filled by the market. If fiction like The Handmaid's Tale shows us a fascist society in which we regress such that women lose our hard-earned rights, Blade Runner 2049 shows us the neoliberal alternative. Alright, I don't think I can reasonably expect most of you to have seen this movie and remember it well, so we're going to have to do a summary. Blade Runner 2049 opens on a title card explaining that in the 30 years since the events of the previous film, the Tyrell Corporation has gone bankrupt after violent rebellions with replicants, the bioengineered slave labor force this film and the last center on, led to bans on their manufacturing. Ecological collapse and impending famine led to the rise of industrialist Neander Wallace through his use of synthetic farming. He took over the Tyrell Corporation's replicant manufacturing and created a new model of replicant that would obey. These replicants were allowed, but the older models would still need to be hunted down and retired. 
We're introduced to Agent K, a replicant Blade Runner tasked with retiring one such replicant played by the less famous wrestler who became an actor. While carrying out this mission, a scan uncovers a box buried outside the replicant's home and his superior officer, Lieutenant Joshi, damn, she's in everything now, says she'll send a team to dig it up. K returns to the police station skyscraper, which towers over the city like a terrifying monolith, and is administered a baseline test, which pretty much just looks like brainwashing, but is to keep track of the emotional state of replicants and watch for deviations. Have you ever been on a date? Cells. Cells. Have you ever had a girlfriend? Cells. Cells. Have you ever held a girl's hand? Interlinked. Interlinked. Have you ever kissed a girl? Interlinked. Interlinked. Have you ever made a girl laugh? Interlinked. Interlinked. After his baseline test, Kay walks home and through his apartment building, getting yelled at, past squatters practically lining the stairwells and into his tiny unit. We're introduced off-screen to his girlfriend, who asks him about his meeting as if he works an office job rather than as a robot assassin for the state. She finally emerges from the kitchen where she's apparently been cooking, except that Kay just finished cooking himself something, and finally it becomes clear that the reason this scene is being shot so weirdly is that his girlfriend, Joy, is a hologram. That's J-O-I. Yes. Really. She's dressed in 50s housewife garb and places a holographic steak frites over his bowl of rice noodles, lights his cigarette with her holographic finger, and tells him to put up his feet and relax. We're going to talk a lot about Joy. With his recent bonus, Kay gifts Joy a device called an emanator, which allows her to be projected anywhere, not just from the rig in his apartment. While he connects her to it, we're treated to this beautiful bit of detail. They get up to the roof to test it, where Kay gets a call from work as they're about to kiss, kind of, which overrides her system, leaving her like this. Kay is called into work and unceremoniously turns off the emanator as he leaves the roof. That is just how men are. Am I right, ladies? Back at the station, a lab technician examines the bones from the box Kay discovered buried at the start of the film. He determines the bones belong to a woman who died in childbirth. Kay discovers a serial number etched into the remains, indicating the woman was a replicant, which shocks Lieutenant Girlboss. Is that a sexist joke? She goes on to explain that The world is built on a wall. It separates kind. Tell either side there's no wall, you bought a war. Or a slaughter. She instructs Kay to cover up this discovery to maintain order, telling him to erase everything, including the child. Kay contemplates this. I've never retired something that was born before. To be born is to have a soul, I guess. But of course obeys. Kay heads to the Wallace Corporation headquarters for information on the dead replicant woman and is informed that she's an old one and will be harder to find information on. What's left of her data shows she was one of the last replicants manufactured by Tyrell before the Prohibition. Love, Neander Wallace's replicant assistant, introduces herself and shows Kay to a data seller. On the way, she notes Kay's emanator, asking if he likes their product. She brings up an archived file associated with the replicant, a scene from the original Blade Runner, Deckard giving the voight Kampf test to Rachel, revealing her as the deceased replicant woman. Love pries a bit, asking if there's anything remarkable to warrant the investigation, which Kay dismisses. Kay goes to interview Gaff, who worked with Deckard in the original Blade Runner, to ask about him, but Gaff says there's no way to find him, saying he's retired. A weighty term in this series, I'm sure you can tell. Love goes to see Neander Wallace, who the film wastes no time characterizing as an absolute creep. An angel should never enter the kingdom of heaven without a gift. She reminds him he wanted to review the new model of replicants, and a naked woman falls from a suspended plastic baggie covered in replicant embryonic liquid, shuddering and on the floor. Wallace meditates on the self-preservation instincts of living creatures as he caresses the replicant woman before summoning his floating seeing eye cameras to inspect her. Wallace declares his desire to own the stars and his intention to use the replicants as slave labor to get there, and to overcome the limitations on their production by creating replicants who can reproduce sexually, which he has so far failed to do. He says all of this while laying his hands on her abdomen before suddenly cutting her there, kissing her on the lips, and leaving her to bleed out on the floor. He reveals he knows Tyrell had created a replicant who could give birth, and asks Love to bring him the child so he can find out how. Kay goes to, I don't know, a cyberpunk food court in a red light district. The wiki says it's Chinatown, I've never been to LA, to look at pictures from where Rachel's remains were found, and a hooded figure instructs a group of sex workers to go get information on him, identifying him as the one who killed Sapper the Dave Batista replicant from the beginning. Two of them notice he's a Blade Runner and leave, but one named Mariette stays to flirt with him, which he lightly rebuffs. He slightly warms up to her, but the Wallace ringtone from his emanator goes off and... Oh, you don't like real girls. Kay goes back to Sapper's home to investigate and finds a baby sock and a photo of a woman holding a baby and a date inscribed on the tree. 
It's this final finding that Kay reacts strongly to. Back at the police station, the lab technician from earlier walks in on Love going through the locker where Rachel's remains are stored. He tries to stop her, and she presents him some documents before punching him in the back of his neck, breaking it, causing his head to fall into his clavicle, turning him into some kind of grotesque human turtle. It haunts me. Kay reports back to Joshi, who informs him that the bones are gone, and he shows her what little he's found. She reminds him again, angrily, that This breaks the world, Kay. And then remarks that she forgets he isn't human sometimes. She asks him to tell her one of his implanted childhood memories, and he tells her about a toy horse he had, which we were later shown had the same date inscribed on it as the tree. He describes running from a group of boys and hiding the toy in a furnace to keep it away from them, and keeping it hidden even as they beat him. Joshi enjoys the story and flirts lightly with Kay, but he takes work as an excuse to leave. Kay goes through the DNA records of children born the inscribed year, letting Joy watch over his shoulder. She knows about the inscription on the horse and asks if it's just a coincidence, but he says it's a dangerous coincidence. She suggests that he might be the child. Pushed into the world. Wanted. Loved. Kay is doubtful, but also says if it were true, he'd be hunted. He identifies two identical sets of DNA, a boy and a girl, which he says isn't possible, so one must be a copy. And the records show they were both sent to an orphanage where the girl died and the boy disappeared. Kay takes Joy with him to the orphanage to investigate. They crash land after being shot down, and Kay kills a bunch of guys who try to break into his flying car, and Love kills the rest by dropping bombs on them from a drone, expecting he can find the child so she doesn't have to. Kay makes his way to the orphanage and demands their records, but the year he wants is missing, ripped out of the book. Kay remembers the toy horse and wanders through the orphanage, finding the place his memory took place. He finds the horse, still in the furnace, and takes it home. Joy celebrates this discovery, declaring him born. Not made. It decides to give him a real name, dubbing him... Joe? He tells her to stop and pushes back that he doesn't know if this memory is an implant or not. He goes to an upgrade center to find the person who makes the memories, Dr. Anna Staline, a woman who lives in isolation behind a glass window due to her compromised immune system. Kay shows her the memory of hiding the horse and she, crying, confirms the memory is real. Kay leaves deeply upset. Kay is intercepted by a police vehicle outside the upgrade center and is arrested and taken back to the station for a baseline test. He is noticeably shaken during the test, and the tester says, You're not even close to baseline. Joshi is furious, but he tells her he found and took care of the child. She is so relieved that she helps him get out of the station, but warns him he needs to get back to normal. When Kay gets home, he tells Joy she was right, and Joy reveals she's hired the sex worker, Mariette, to, well, make her real for him. In the morning, Mariette plants a tracker in Kay's jacket and examines the toy horse. Joy tells Mariette she's done with her and that she can leave, and Mariette says this... I've been inside you. Not so much there as you think. ...and leaves. Kay resolves to go on the run, and Joy tells him to delete her from the console and take her in the emanator, reminding him that the police will have access to her memories otherwise. Leaving her without a backup if anything happens to the emanator. Like a real girl. Love sees the console go offline. Through some kind of questionable radiation-based location sleuthing, Kay and Joy find their way to a highly radiated, deserted Las Vegas full of giant, somewhat pornographic statues of naked women. Love breaks into Lieutenant Joshi's office, demanding to know where Kay is. She tells Love Kay killed the child and destroyed all the evidence. Love attacks Joshi, mocking her fear of great change and challenging the idea that replicants like her are so obedient, so incapable of lying. She tells her she's going to tell Wallace she killed Joshi in self-defense, and slices through her abdomen with a knife. Ooh, looks familiar. Love gets access to the police database and gets Kay's location. Bees! Kay finds his way into a nearby abandoned hotel and quietly explores until he encounters a grizzled Deckard, who chases Kay around the hotel with a gun until Kay finally lets himself get punched enough to convince him he's not there to hurt or apprehend him. Kay asks him about the child and about Rachel, and Deckard explains with a lot of irritation that he'd helped scramble the records to hide the child, and that he'd gone into hiding too to keep them safe. Love and some other Wallace goons show up having tracked Kay there, blow some stuff up, and take Deckard away with them. Kay tries to stop them, already gravely injured, but Love takes him down. Joy appears and pleads with Love to stop, and she responds. I do hope you're satisfied with our product. I love you! They leave Kay, badly hurt and bleeding, now truly alone. Kay is discovered unconscious by a group of figures in dark clothing, and one retrieves the tracker Mariette left. They, Mariette with them, take him back to their hiding place and introduce him to Freza, the hooded woman from earlier, who turns out to be the leader of this replicant rebellion. 
Fraser reveals that she was there when the child was born and when Rachel died. She explains that the miracle of Rachel giving birth to this child showed her that replicants like her were not just slaves, that... If a baby can come from one of us, we are our own masters. And that they're building a revolution, and gives us one of the film's many theses on the nature of humanity. Dying for the right cause is the most human thing we can do. She then tells him he will have to kill Decker to protect the child and, by extension, their fight for freedom. Deckard only wanted his baby to be safe. And she is. Wait, what was that? And she is. She is. She is. She? Kay takes his revelation that the idea of being the child that he had just finally started to settle in with was all a lie about as well as could be expected. I'm not going to have a chance to talk about this later because it's not what I'm focusing on in this video, but I really love this subversion. Played straight as a chosen one narrative, I think we would have lost a lot of the importance of his burgeoning sense of humanity being tied up in the idea that he was born and wanted. Kate breaks in this moment not merely because he thought he was special, but because he thought he might have a soul, that he might be real. And for him, that was tied up in him being this child. Kay realizes that the child had only been hidden as a boy, and realizes that the reason he has the memories is not because he lived them, but that the person who made his memories did. Deckard wakes up in Wallace's office, and Wallace begins to interrogate him, holding Rachel's skull in his lap. He explains he needs the child to figure out how to make them all capable of reproduction. Wallace plays the audio from when Deckard and Rachel met for the first time, and continues to prod about who helped hide the child, and finally reveals he has created another Rachel, offering her to Deckard in exchange for information. Deckard is overwhelmed, but finally says, Her eyes were green. Before turning away, and love shoots her in the head. Wallace tells Deckard he will have him taken off world and tortured. A battered K walks alone in the city and is approached by a holographic ad for Joy, a massive pink naked figure. The ad greets K exactly as his Joy did and even calls him a good Joe, just kind of rubbing in both his face and ours how pre programmed so much of her was. K decides to die for a cause and intercepts the transport, taking Deckard off world. Love is forced to have the transport land and K storms in, killing the other goons, leaving just him, Deckard, and Love. They fight for Deckard's fate, and Kay finally kills Love, drowning her. Kay saves Deckard, who tells him he should have let him die, but Kay says they will think he drowned, that he's now free to see his daughter. Kay takes him to her facility, gives him the toy horse, and sends him inside to meet his daughter. He sits on the steps, examining his clothes, drenched in blood from his injuries, lays down, and dies. Probably. It's somewhat ambiguous. Dr. Staline greets Deckard. They both approach the glass, and Deckard, tearfully but with a small smile, reaches his hand up to the glass. Cut to black. Blade Runner 2049 is a film that has a lot to say. Director Denis Villeneuve is probably better known for Arrival, which had a lot of big ideas. And Blade Runner 2049 is no different. And like a lot of idea-dense films, it invites many interpretations of its themes, as well as a lot of interesting threads that aren't fully explored in the film, but make for interesting jumping-off points for other conversations. I think the latter is probably the fairer assessment of my analysis here. If I had to reduce the take I have in Blade Runner 2049 into one thesis, it would probably be something like, Blade Runner 2049 shows us a world in which, under a kind of hyper-capitalist system, gender roles have become commodified and technologized for the advancement of society, and the replicants are both the tools of and participants in that system. Now what do I even mean by that? Well, to start with, even carrying over from the first film, there are jobs that replicants were literally designed to do. These are jobs that are considered dangerous or undesirable work for humans, or for one reason or another, replicants are better suited to. Soldiers, field officers, combat medics, assassins, sex workers, sex worker assassins, secretaries. A lot of these things happen to be work that has a largely gendered connotation. Many jobs we strongly associate with men due to their danger and physical labor requirements are mainly done by replicants for those same reasons. Likewise, sex work has historically done by mainly women as a means of gaining independence, economic and even social. But here there are replicants manufactured to fill these roles. It's also notable that in a brief scene, Love tries to sell a customer on adding pleasure models to her order for a drill site, indicating that while intelligence, attachment, or appeal would be wasted on the worker replicants, they would be suitable for the pleasure ones, indicating an emotional aspect to these replicants' work. But it's not just that this traditionally gendered work is being done by replicants. 
At least as far as we can tell, the humans who manufactured them chose to make replicants that looked like men to be soldiers and police, and replicants that looked like women, sex workers, and secretaries. And yes, obviously, most of the sex worker androids are going to be women. I know who buys real dolls. But the interesting aspect to me isn't so much, why would they make them this way? That's not particularly complicated in my opinion. I'm more interested in what this would do to a society. A world where for human men there isn't any kind of the dangerous hard work so many men tie their identities to. The most popular vehicle would probably be whatever the flying car version of this is. And I imagine it would also probably put a lot of working class people out of a job. On the other hand, this is also a world in which for humans these roles seem to be somewhat less rigid. There are women in positions of leadership that are treated as pretty unremarkable. The biggest example, of course, is Lieutenant Joshi. She's in the top position in a field that's broadly considered to be masculine, and she's just in charge. It goes completely unremarked upon in the film, though certain subsections of the audience definitely noticed. Thank you, 4chan. This unhinged posting serves my point. It's as though replicants fulfilling labor traditionally done by women have allowed them to achieve more in their careers, to some degree shedding the social roles of womanhood in the process. Another aspect that's clearly pretty intentional in the film is the focus on reproduction. It's one of the key motivators in the plot. It's both the main motivation for the villain and the justification for Kay's involvement in the story. Lieutenant Joshi is convinced that the balance of the entire society, the ideology that scaffolds the division between autonomous human and android slave, is at least partially based on reproductive ability. And the film features an entire revolutionary movement who seem to have at least been initially inspired by the idea that the miracle of their capacity for reproduction was an indication of their humanity. While I was searching for other people who had noted and written on the gender and reproduction related aspects of Blade Runner 2049, I came across an essay by Marina Fedosik that I thought put this idea really well. Comparing the theming of this movie with its predecessor, she writes, While the original Blade Runner represents the difference between replicants and humans as a lack of empathy, the sequel imagines the difference as the inability to reproduce sexually. She makes the argument that the focus the film has on sexual reproduction as a proxy for humanity parallels an increased emphasis on biology in our understanding of our own humanity brought on by the developments in genomics and assisted reproductive technologies. Her essay also goes on to explain the societal understanding of how we tie up some of our ideas about humanity and individuality and our biological heritage, and how this relates to the way Kay's belief in his own humanity is a direct result of his belief that he may have been born, not made. She's ultimately critical of how the film handles Kay's humanity as, in the end of the film, he essentially gains his humanity by sacrificing himself in the name of natural-born humanity. For me, something that stands out about the reproduction motif in this film is the way that for different characters, it alternately represents a claim to humanity or a tool of human expansion. Joshi recognizes that her duty in this society is to maintain order, and in this story, the main real threat to that is that replicants and humans alike might discover replicants can reproduce, and that would challenge one of their fundamental justifying ideologies. And she's absolutely right, there's already a revolution building around this kid. And Neander Wallace, probably the single most powerful person in this society, seems to not care about this at all, and in fact is actively working to accelerate it as a way to expand his corporation and its influence. There's an active conflict between Wallace's ambitions for owning the stars and some of the fundamental assumptions that allow the society he to some degree depends on to operate. Wallace either doesn't realize the balance he's threatening or he doesn't care. Perhaps understandably confident that a new ideology to justify the replicant's further enslavement will emerge or be created to replace this one, as historically new ideas around power have emerged as old ones fall out of use or out of favor. Such as, for instance, the shift from monarchs justifying their rule through divine right to the notion of the will of the people in representative republics. Wallace's success would allow the perpetuation of the labor force to occur without needing every worker to be individually manufactured. This essentially completes the picture of replicants taking on human gender roles, making female replicants not just into the performers of sexual and emotional labor, but able to reproduce the workforce as women of the underclasses have always done. All of this likely without the social and emotional motivation in human relationships, a fully commodified form under direct control of a corporation. It's this commodified state for replicants that we find Kay in, and it's where Joy fits into the picture. So let's talk about Kay a little. Kay is a character who has had further reach than the film itself and has become a sort of avatar for a certain type of young man, one who is lonely, alienated, and extremely online. Invoked not just to talk about Blade Runner 2049, but as a stand-in for the author in Unrelated Posts. In Blade Runner 2049, Kay is our point-of-view character, and it's him we're most invited to empathize with over the course of the film. 
What we see is an almost unrelentingly bleak life. Kay is one of the generation of replicants built to be obedient, but this obedience is clearly not absolute. Not just because Kay and other obedient replicants are able to rebel, but it's also made clear in the way this obedience is enforced. Kay is not an unpaid slave. He's not stored like a tool and given the bare minimum to survive. He gets bonuses, he can afford some small luxuries, he has an apartment of his own, albeit a bare bones one. His life resembles that of an underpaid worker more than what we would generally recognize as slavery, though slavery would still be an accurate description of the situation. His obedience is also not assumed. He's regularly given the baseline test, which itself feels like it's as much intended to condition as it is to evaluate, to ensure he's still operating as intended, and it's implied the consequence of failing this test is death, not some kind of reprogramming. Within the society of Blade Runner 2049, there's a recognition of at least some kind of humanity in the replicants. Specifically that to keep them obedient, they require some basic niceties. Just enough that they're compliant. And joy plays a pivotal role in this. In the post-industrial era, when work moved out of the house and into factories and later offices, there was a shift in the domestic roles of middle-class women from that of active participation in the production of goods and services and on family farm or store to what we would today recognize as that of the housewife. And it was the duty of the housewife to act as a source of rejuvenation for their husbands. They would clean and keep and beautify the home to give their working husbands a place to come where things were comfortable and relaxing so they could continue to work. Of course, this ideal was never really a reality for many, and the idea of having a person whose life is largely dedicated to the emotional and domestic maintenance of another is understandably less popular these days. But it speaks to an idea that work is draining and requires some sort of emotional support, some human connection to be sustained. And for a man, traditionally, this emotional human connection is a romantic partner. This is the role that Joy occupies. Joy is probably the most popular think piece fodder to come from this movie. Depending on the perspective of the writer, she was alternatively half of a touching love story, a representation of everything wrong with how gender was handled not just in this story, but in media overall, a representation of the bleak, artificial future of Blade Runner 2049, or a beacon of hope for a kind of transcendence through AI of the human spirit. Whether or not Joy is real remains hotly debated, and while I personally think the ambiguity itself serves the narrative thematically better than definitively assuming one way or the other, I ultimately care more about the acknowledgement that her characterization serves a purpose and, while not beyond criticism, is underserved by criticism that solely focuses on how good an example of female representation in films she is. All of that being said, I'm going to be talking about Joy mostly as a product, in terms of how her existence serves our understanding of this society, and less as a character, at least in the scope of this discussion. At her core, Joy is an AI companion who simulates a romantic relationship for the user. Joy is physically infinitely customizable. Everything from her eye color and body type to her ethnicity can be chosen by the user. Her programming molds her to his preferences, prompting her to shift seamlessly into different outfits and interests to find something to perk him up. As the ads looming over the dystopian cityscape remind us, she's everything you want to see, everything you want to hear. Joy is a sole source of emotional refuge for Kay, and for the greater part of their early interactions, Kay summons her mainly for this purpose but this emotional support is necessarily limited. This is largely due to his doubts that she and her feelings are real, which causes him to constantly rebuke any attempt she makes at intimacy with him, such as here in the rooftop scene. I'm so happy when I'm with you. You don't have to say that. Another contributing factor, however, is simply her programming and how she's designed to be interacted with. Joy is not designed to build a mutually fulfilling relationship with the user. Her purpose is to make them happy. As an AI, she has no needs. She can be switched off if she's not needed. She can give endlessly and never needs anything in return. As Brian Formo writes in his article on the women of Blade Runner 2049, in many ways, it's easier to be doted upon, be asked questions, and bask in the glow of someone who possesses the agreed upon perfect femme physique by a realistic program than it would be to enter into a relationship with a human woman who might challenge, not always worship, nor find her partner attractive at all times. But you'd lose your humanity in the process, right? Because it places your needs on a shelf without compromise or concession. To borrow and stretch an observation Cup Philosophy makes in his video about Hegelian recognition and incels, it's Kay's lack of belief in Joy's humanity that makes her love and recognition of him unsatisfying. In order to gain more than just a surface-level sense of companionship from her, he would need to believe that she's real, 
and also see her as an equal. For replicants like Kay, the idea of having an emotional self in the form of a wife isn't a possibility, and so having an AI to accomplish this becomes necessary in a way. And this is at least common enough in this society that there's a broadly advertised product with specialized upgrades that is mainly advertised to straight men to specifically address the issue of loneliness, and in particular romantic loneliness. And probably not surprisingly, this is an aspect of Kay those who project onto him heavily relate to. Joy is the AI girlfriend experience. She is the commodification of the emotional care roles traditionally filled by women, done not in a way that satisfies the actual human need for connection, but that makes the loneliness a little less stark, a hyper-sophisticated gate box. She can even be paused by an incoming work call, because life for replicants is not about connection with other beings, even artificial ones. Life is work. Transhumanism is the promise to humanity that we can overcome human limitations, that we can become something better than human through the use of technology. It also happens to be something a lot of science fiction, either thematically or incidentally, is critical of. In the world of Blade Runner 2049, through technology, humanity is in some regards progressed past the need to do dangerous and undesirable work, past the need to form connections with others, and eventually perhaps even the need to manufacture these technologies themselves. And yet, the people of Blade Runner's future aren't better than human. Their world is on the edge of ruin. What progress they do have is scaffolded by the countless lives and immeasurable suffering of the ones turning the gears, and some not insignificant portion of people have replaced human interaction with a simulacrum. Sound familiar? Maybe that's a little unfair. Look, I'm not a Luddite. Technology in our world isn't sentient. Yet. Egg freezing is in theory a really good thing. But there's a reason I started this essay talking about how a lot of domestic labor has become a service to support the shift we've had toward dual income households. At least in the present, we don't have technology that can do our childcare or housework for us. We have other people. Usually people who aren't getting paid all that well. Even the current technology around these services is ultimately just some gig economy bullshit. Jesus Christ, there are so many of them. I read a book on the history of women's labor called Women Have Always Worked by Alice Kessler Harris to prepare to write this essay. And one thing that became pretty clear early on was that the levels and types of freedoms women had varied pretty starkly depending on their class, whether they had to or chose to work or didn't work at all. Even between women who worked, there were large divisions. The middle class women who only worked up until marriage did not have the same desire for shortened work days as their lower class counterparts who worked their entire lives nor did they have the same investments in their career unionizing would have required. The divisions in the present have shifted in a lot of ways, but there remains a stark difference in the way higher and lower income women relate to their work and how easily they're able to navigate the demands of the modern economy. And a lot of that comes from the fact that professional women are directly dependent on the underpaid labor of domestic and childcare workers. As discouraging as all of that is, there's a notable historical example of unexpected solidarity we could probably learn from. At the turn of the 20th century, there was an organization called the National Women's Trade Union League, where mostly middle-class, unmarried, educated women advocated for and worked with working-class women. These experiences led them to a more systemic understanding of the causes of poverty and thus to union advocacy and political action. Here, organizing strategy, strike leadership, and labor know-how came from the wage-earning women, and the higher-income women, known as their allies, made use of their social position, financial security, and relative leisure to support them. I'm not suggesting we politically organize along gender lines, far from it. The concerns women have as workers, time and flexibility, childcare, healthcare, wages, these are issues for all of us who work for a living. And the only reason we think of some of them as women's issues is that they're still considered women's responsibilities. Part of the solution here is going to require men to take on more of the cleaning and childcare. But while the progress made by the modern feminist movement has gotten us to a point where the lives of many professional women are pretty on par with their male counterparts, it hasn't really done the same for lower income women. And for all the benefits that have come of that economic equality, one of the things we've gained is the privilege to spend most of our time working. This isn't a recipe for a satisfying life. Everyone deserves more than that. What I want to impart is that my version of a feminist world is one where we have the time and energy and freedom to live meaningful lives and spend time with people we love, not just do whatever makes us and our bosses as much money as possible. And I want that freedom for everyone, not just people with cushy, flexible tech jobs like me. In order to get there, we're going to need to build power together, whether that be through parties, unions, or community-based support. How else are we going to get male trad wives? 
Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video. The idea for this one actually predates this channel, and it's been one I've been afraid to make for a while because it loomed so large in my head. But I now think it's the video I'm the most proud of, and that feels really good. I want to start posting more regularly, which will be hard since I'm such a procrastinator, but I'm thinking I want to make some shorter, less research-intensive videos. So please let me know what you think in the comments, and feel free to recommend any topics you'd like to see. And of course, tell me your thoughts on this video, and maybe argue with me about joy. That's always fun. This, to me, represented a development in our culture's attempts to answer the question, what will it take, what will it take to get you to stop jumping on the thing?